Go ahead, Dr. Chapman. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Jens Chapman, and uh, welcome to our May edition on a Thursday evening of the Washington State Orthopedic Association monthly re-op meetings. So it's very cool that all of you took the time and uh, improvised to come on a to come together on a Thursday night. Today's May 27, 2021. We have an absolutely outstanding program that I'm very excited to introduce you to. And please, for all of you who are in Washington State as orthopedic surgeons, do join WSOA. Join our multiple exciting endeavors, both educationally as well as in terms of representing our specialty and musculoskeletal wellness. On that subject matter, briefly, we have three fantastic speakers, and my co-host is Dr. Michael Thorpe from Bellingham, uh, the giant from up north, and we literally cover the bandwidth of the great United States of America by going all the way out east. It's a great honor and pleasure to have Dr. Stephen Cates, professor and chairman, I'll introduce him in more detail later, uh, join us from Richmond, Virginia, uh, from VCU, He's an internationally renowned expert on multiple areas in orthopedics. He's changed the game, but he's a particularly uh, amazing uh, research and clinician and wellness specialist. And on the far west, we have Dr. Neil Schonert in Hawaii, Kona, Hawaii, uh, with his leisure uh, outfit. And uh, so we have the whole bandwidth covered, and he's going to uh, be the middle uh, uh, anchor post of our lectures today. And he's going to present on how to translate research um, uh, into actually better reimbursements. So without much further ado, welcome again tonight. No musical intro tonight because our guitar player, Dr. Alan Greenwald, came late. Congratulations, new father-in-law, Mazel Tov. Nice to see you. <laughs> My co-host, Dr. Michael Thorpe from the great up north. Uh, we ended last month's session with a very inspirational and thought-provoking talk by a young UW resident, a female resident who talked about diversity in her workforce. And as she's entering the field and her perspectives on that. And we thought this would be a great opportunity for uh, you who is such a mainstay of orthopedic surgery in our state and uh, certainly in your community to reflect on retirement. And as we were talking about this, uh, there were a couple of surprising thoughts that came up. So without much further ado, thank you, Dr. Thorpe, um, uh, for taking on the role of co-host. And for a bio background, he was a UW resident. We all knew him and loved him there. He graduated in 1998. Before that, he was in medical school at the University of Iowa, and he just undergraduate at Drake University. So Mike, take it from here. Tell us a little bit about your perspectives from Bellingham and as a freshly retired orthopedic colleague, what surprised you? Okay, well, thanks, Jens. Thanks, and uh, welcome uh, from Bellingham. Thank you for also saying I graduated residency in 1998. You just took 10 years off of my life. 1988. I said 80. 1988. <laughs> so with Turn that, you know, I, I just retired uh, December 31st after 32 and a half years here, and I, I was uh, told to show my new business card. It's uh, not my problem anymore. So that's my new business card. Anyway, so as I think back, um, coming out of the UW, 1988, straight to Bellingham, it was a community of about 60,000 at that time. There's a few trends that I've um, noticed and, and um, noted that there's been the move from mom and pop shops to business. There's also been a move from generalists to subspecialists. Uh, and also a move from all uh, orthopedists were in private practice to now there's a mixture here in Bellingham of private and hospital employed. So when I came, there were three groups of two. I took over a practice, hung my shingle, took out a loan, you know, just started up and uh, everything was really good. There's one hospital here, a Christian hospital. Um, we were all generalists, as I said. And uh, then what started happening is, is we got to one of our colleagues, Dr. Keith Mayo, to leave Harborview, and he was our first fellowship trained uh, doc and joined us for uh, being the traumatologist. And, and then in 1992, another UW resident joined me, Dr. Gary Bergman, who's a hand uh, fellowship trained physician. 
2001, we got a spine fellow to join us from UW. So we were moving towards subspecialties. Um, about that time, we um, ran into the issue with a hospital over ER call. And everyone's been through that. We were unpaid. There were only six of us, seven of us. We were getting killed. Um, you know, the time away from your private practice uh, was, was uh, very hard financially. And uh, there was no post-trauma block, no PAs, no pay. So we approached the hospital in 2004 and we said, um, we need to be paid. And I consulted Dr. Brad Henley. He suggested because we were a level two trauma center, we should be getting $1,500 a day. I uh, asked around the country, it, it ranged from 500 to 2,500. We asked for a thousand, which was basically our daily overhead. As expected, the hospital had been getting free call coverage for decades said, get back to work. And so uh, that's when uh, I decided as, as the head of the orthopedic department to draw a line in the sand and say, that's not gonna cut it anymore. Um, they still wouldn't budge. And so in January, 2005, I took my last ER call day and moved my practice completely out of the hospital uh, to our surgery center. Um, even though I was a generalist um, doing just about everything in, in fact, Jens, you'd be interested. I, uh, Christmas Eve, 1990, I used Harrington rods and rotted and stabilized and fused a thoracic lumbar uh, dislocation, fracture dislocation, <laughs> you know, not being a spine specialist, but up here, you know, you could do that kind of stuff in hand and foot. So anyway, um, I left the hospital practice and we had a surgery center, fortunately, but it was a community owned surgery center, not our own practices surgery center. <laughs> But it allowed me to move my total joint practice there and everything else. And, and so that really allowed a big change in my life, my practice. Uh, I was no longer tied to the hospital uh, like so many of the other guys. Uh, we continued to fill Bellingham with fellowship trained people. We got a sports medicine uh, trained person in 2010. Um, my colleague, Dr. Bergman, retired in 2018 and we got another a uh, hand fellowship trained surgeon who did his fellowship at the UW. So we're heavily UW oriented. Um, and then in 2020, when I retired, just before I did, we got another sports medicine fellowship trained person. Um, and in, in September of 21, we will get a foot fellow. Our, our practice is first um, fellowship trained foot surgeon coming out of the UW also. He's right now in fellowship with uh, Bruce Sanjorson and Hanson and Manushka. So uh, uh, Theron Udawada will be joining us. Um, so the, um, the other trend is this private practice versus employee. And we have a collegial uh, relationship up here, however, competitive. You know, the hospital is a gorilla. It's the only hospital around. Um, they are able to uh, pay their employed docs uh, we believe a much better base salary um, than, than our generalists, uh, which we only have one now. Um, I think our fellowship trained guys though, because of their different business model and so forth, they're probably doing better than theirs. But um, you know, the, the uh, advantages that we have in private practice is we're nimble. We can adjust, we're flexible. We can make a change in a day, uh, something we want to do. We also can add ancillaries. Um, uh, uh, we, we have looked at ultrasound and MRI and our own PT and those kind of things. We're behind the, behind the times compared to Seattle on that, but uh, looking now at some PT with a highly productive hand surgeon and a foot surgeon coming in. Um, the biggest thing that our group's working on right now is, is getting our very own orthopedic ASC Wish we had done that 20 years ago, but uh, we didn't feel in this market we could take on that financial risk to do that. Um, also, uh, the, the, I mentioned the trend away from, um, I, you know, I was a mom and pop. I was a Marcus Welby <laughs> in orthopedics. I sat down and talked to my patient for quite a while, examined them thoroughly, got some tests. You know, we made a plan together, that whole thing. That's just the way we were trained. Um, that is moving away with my younger uh, colleagues and uh, they rely more on technology. Uh, they, they see many more patients a day than, 
I mean, if I saw 30 a day, that was a very busy day. Um, they're seeing 30 in the morning. <laughs> you know, they're using PAs in a different manner than, than I would. I'd only use it in surgery. So that, that whole trend towards business is something I definitely see reflecting back, uh, back at it. Um, to help them uh, financially, uh, because of not having the backing of an employer, uh, March 1st, my group, Pacific Rim uh, Orthopedic Surgeons, joined ProLiance. So they are now a member of the big mega group up and down the I-5 corridor, which they hope will make them uh, uh, viable in the long term, because the pendulum, as you know, has been kind of moving away from private practice. But um, we are fiercely independent. Uh, we have no plans of ever being employed. Um, and the things I like about that is, you know, this is my business. This is my practice. I will fall on the sword for my practice. And I don't know if um, they can speak for themselves, but the docs who are employed, um, you know, if you're, would you fall on the sword for Swedish, Jens? Would you fall on the sword for Virginia Mason? You know, that kind of feeling. Um, I love it. Um, I, I fight for my group. Even though I'm retired, I send everybody I talk to to our group, and um, I'm very proud of them. I feel like I left my group better than I found it, you know, and uh, that's a great feeling. So I'm very happy to be in retirement. Um, a lot of people, I think, express concerns that when you retire, having been so busy and so on all the time that you're going to twiddle your thumbs, maybe become depressed. Um, you know, things like that. And that has not happened for me. Fortunately, um, I have five children and four live in our town and eight of my 10 grandchildren are here. So I drive kids to a school every morning and I pick them up at three and I help my son build a house. It's the same tools I've always used. They're just not sterile and uh, nobody hands <laughs> them to me. <laughs> but, uh, Life, life is good. Um, I think that if I was speaking to a resident, I would just say live frugally, don't live beyond your means so that you can retire uh, at a decent time. Invest well. I think the best thing you can do to invest is invest in your practice, you know, in, in, in the ancillaries. Um, I, I, I would say don't practice too long. Um, the 60s are the decade of go, go, go. The 70s are slow, 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 and the 80s are no, no, no. So don't wait too long. Um, <laughs> so that's my message. Well, thank, thank you so much. And it's uh, very heartfelt and uh, uh, very convincing. And you look fantastic and have obviously done a great job. And I, I have to say that uh, this generational change has me a little bit worried, but I have also great faith that there'll be somebody stepping into your shoes. But you're always a beacon like a master concierge for the North where I could just call you and say, who do I send this patient to? And you always knew it. And the patient always felt like they had a platinum entry card to whatever practice uh, I sent uh, the patient to. So uh, your, your uh, effects were amazing and uh, your quality of care is dramatic. Um, do you miss operating at all? Do you miss being with patients or is it just all happiness? I mean, looking at yeah, your smile. No, I, what's hardest is if somebody comes to me and goes, guy, you fixed my, hip or knee uh, five years ago, now I need the other one. Oh, I would just love to fix that for them, you know? Um, and I still have people call me up or ask me who they should see, uh, or I, I give them advice over the phone or, or in person if I run into them. I have to be a little careful. I don't have malpractice insurance, <laughs> you know? But uh, yeah, I, I would miss that. I miss the people, you know, the, the personal relationships with some patients and uh, with my staff, both at the surgery center and the office. Uh, fortunately, um, I get to see, so far I've been getting to see my office staff every week or two because some mail still comes there and that kind of thing. But, um, One more question, then we'll have to probably move on unless uh, uh, Dr. Cates or Dr. Sean have another urgent question for you. In our last couple of sessions, the theme came up that an ASC is a very good weapon against these large corporations. Uh, who should own that ASC? Is every ASC the same or is a private practice group owned ASC better in a competitive advantage perspective than a corporate owned and uh, run ASC? Right. Well, I think um, economically, if you can run it yourself with your own administrator, uh, that would be the best financially for you. Um, in our location, 
it's sometimes hard to get personnel like that qualified to run the ASC and we may have to bring in a, a management company. And, that, and that's what we had to do on our community owned ASC. Um, you know, I mentioned the Bellingham, um, we put together Pacific Rim Outpatient Surgery Center back in 03 and shareholders included anesthesiologists, um, urologists, people who don't do a lot of surgery at it. And that over time ate away at those of us who produced. I was 20% of the revenue. Uh, my group was 45% of the revenue. And yet, you know, I got 4% of the profit because I owned six and a half shares out of 133. So, it, you know, that was nice. It was very low risk. I didn't have to put money, money in and it was run for me and I could sleep at night not worrying about it. But in retrospect, financially, we would have been much better off if we had our own center. And that's, that's where, our, where our group is moving now is to have an orthopedic surgery center for our group. Yeah, Mike, this is Neil. I agree with you completely. Uh, I, I uh, graduated a year after you. I hung out my own private shingle. Uh, did that for five years, then built a group around me, then merged that group to ProLiance, then built our own ASC and our own MRI and our own therapy and all of the, the what Mike was mentioning as a, the components of uh, success in modern day practice are ancillaries in addition to uh, your private practice and the flexibility, uh, the nimbleness with which you can respond to uh, changes in your market. Uh, and the fact that you own, it's your home uh, yes. and you are the owner. You're responsible for the headaches. You're also, uh, you also get the, the, the blessings and the joy. You know, in the, in the turn down of 08, every single woman employed in our practice kept her job and all of their families were maintained by our practice. We docs uh, uh, took a hit, but Decades later, the loyalty around a, a, a corporate structure, a health system would not have done that. Yeah. The, the nurses would have been on the chopping block in a New York minute. Right. Uh, and you can do that in your community and boy, does it resonate. The ripples uh, on that pond go way beyond your ability to see. So good on you. That sounds yeah, like a wonderful practice. So yeah. great. Thank you, Mike, for a great perspective. Thank you for co-hosting us and uh, congratulations on a very successful career. And I do hope that you at least spiritually will stay with us for many, many years to come with your advice and insights and uh, just uh, winning personality. Pivoting over a very successful practitioner, Dr. Neil Schonert, spine surgeon, UCSF grad, fellowship at Rothman, which will be a topic in the near future, I sense, coming for our state as Rothman is looking out west to come to Washington a State. Theater near you. Um, exactly. So uh, Dr. Schonert uh, has been very successful. He's in the South Sound area uh, near Puyallup. Uh, he's a ProLiance surgeon. He's a spine surgery colleague. And he's always amazed me because he has somehow found the time and the drive to be active in the academic world. Very much like what young Dr. Kennedy showed us several months ago uh, in his presentation from the Mayo Clinic. So as a private practitioner, he has launched registries very successfully and taken them to maturation where they actually influence reimbursement. And many of us will have questions how you did this, Neil. So Dr. Sean, without much further, further ado, please take us from here. So I'm gonna segue from Mike uh, by saying that uh, for those of you who are young, uh, there are two senior uh, uh, surgeons on this panel who went into private practice and both of them are smiling broadly. That smile is not shared by health system colleagues uh, and uh, uh, be mindful that um, in all the days of your life, the more that you smile, uh, the greater the joy that you're living with. And so now I'm going to go into um, my topic. So uh, am I running? Oh, I hope I am. And away we go. I'm uh, going to be talking about... Dr. Shana, do you... Linda, are you going to help me here? Because yeah, I don't see... Right Maybe it hasn't been transferred to me. Yep. Oh, there we go. So I'm gonna talk about registries and how they impact. Although I'm gonna be looking at this from a clinician's perspective, um, please um, understand that's the topic I was assigned. Uh, what I'm gonna show you is impacts that affect 
five arenas. And the easiest thing to remember is the five P's. Uh, for startup companies, they have it down to three, but for physicians, uh, it, it's five. Uh, the patient is number one, the, the physician is number two. That's the hierarchical of our historical relationship. The payer is number three, or as the Canadians say, the payee, but the payer is number three. And you can also substitute that for a purchaser, a Microsoft, an Amazon, a Boeing, a uh, uh, Costco that purchase healthcare uh, for their uh, employees. And then you have product and device manufacturers. You can also put pharma in there. Uh, and then lastly, policy makers, policy makers. Shonard, if you click right here first. I think I just did, and I'm hoping that it behaves. Okay, you just tell me when you want me to advance your slides. Oh, go ahead. Yes, I'm ready. Thank you. So uh, when you look at registries, uh, you can see them as prospective observational data platforms, different from a randomized control trial. And you can have them disease specific. The thing that you, so you can have a joint replacement uh, registry, you can have a spine registry, you can have a vertebral compression fracture registry. The great thing about registries is they put the understanding of medicine in the proper order. You look at the entire population, that's the heterogeneity of disease, everybody who's got a bad hip or who's got a bad spine or who's got a vertebral compression fracture or has osteoporosis, so everybody. And you gather data on all of them. And then you look at the heterogeneity of treatment, all of the different ways your colleagues take care of the problem. And I don't care if they take care of it in a hospital, uh, in a fluoroscopy suite, in their office, in an ambulatory surgery center, or in a broom closet on the, on the top of the building. I don't care as long as everybody gets measured by the same yardstick. And those are the outcomes, the pain, the function, the return to work, everybody gets measured by the same yardstick. Because the advantage of doing that is allows you access to the healthcare utilization costs. And that's where you answer the value equation. The value equation doesn't occur in any of those colors other than the orange color. And when you're answering the value equation, you're answering for the people who are the purchasers or the payers. Uh, uh, and you can look at how much does it cost to do an ASC hip replacement, an ASC disc replacement, uh, a vertebral augmentation for a patient with osteoporosis. And you can look at the different sites of care and you can see where the savings are. And that's where population medicine wants to go. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Nope, it's up to you, Linda. So when you take a look at this, the value is always for the individual who's trying to ask the equation. So here I'm putting the patient uh, as the, the person asking the value. You know, when, when I send my kids to school, what's the value of that school? When I purchase a home, what's the value of that home? And you're looking at cost and quality. And for us as physicians, that's, that's your risk stratification. And when you're looking for how long does that benefit last, that's your surveillance. But, you know, is it one year you're going to measure? Is it two years? Is it five years? Next, please, Linda. So what you need to understand about registries is they are not research. They're quality improvement. So if you're doing an arthroscopic ACL and you're using a Marcane or a REC concoction or you're using Expirel, those are just different ways of doing the same procedure. As long as you're using the same metrics, what's the 24 hour pain relief? What's the three day pain relief? What's the 10 day opioid use? The same way that Boeing looks at, well, Boeing's tough right now, but well, Boeing looks at um, aircraft control mechanisms or uh, Toyota looks at producing a pickup truck exactly the same these are quality improvement. They're not uh, research. And you may find small sub cohorts within that in which you can do a randomized control trial and you already know how many patients are in that group. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful way to improve your practice. And that's what I'm going to show you. Next slide is ways that you improve your practice that improve uh, uh, your revenue. And the way that registries work is they use the same yardstick and they put benchmarks on it top third, middle third, bottom third. 
they focus on patient reported outcomes because that's what matters. Not how satisfying the surgery was for you, but how quickly did the patient return to work? How little pain did they suffer? How rapid was their improvement in their function? You can look at the process of care for efficiencies, but in the end, the benchmarking is going to show you the lowest cost avenue that maintains an equivalent beneficial outcome. Next slide, please. That's why it's quality improvement. So now let's look at the rewards of these five Ps. And next slide. So the first thing we're gonna look at is the five Ps and there they are on the left. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to speak from a payer perspective. Uh, so these are slides from the spine fusion, spine <laughs> Uh, 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 registry that Jens and I and Dave Flum put together, but this is the state of Washington saving $83 million. And notice that the slope of the cost curve for the scope hospital, the orange hospital is flatter and the overall costs are flatter. So you are helping a payer with an annual savings and that's just from the enrolled hospitals. If all of the hospitals were enrolled, the savings is much greater. So this is population health on an economic scale. Next slide, please. Same goes for, I didn't show Medicare, but uh, next slide, Linda. Oh, here, here we go with Medicare. Now this is, this was what changed. It, it's not the benefit to the patient, it's the cost. So here you're looking at vertebral augmentation. So little old ladies with osteoporosis, vertebral compression fractures, if they come into my clinic on day one, they only have three images, uh, uh, an injury image, x-ray, an injury MRI, and then a follow-up Im uh, image post cement augmentation. And notice how dysfunctional they are. The Roland Morris scale goes to 24 and at 24, your hospice bed read, bedridden uh, uh, in agonal breathing, and they're at 20. So they can't get out of the house. They can't get dressed. They 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 need someone to help them with their home. Their pain severity on a zero to 10 scale is eight out of 10. So they are horribly painful. And if I operate on them, their pain scale goes from eight to one. Now. An 85-year-old woman with a pain level of one is dancing on the table. She's taken out her grandkids to the beach. They're, they're walking and doing everything they want. And a functional change from 20, uh, Roland Morris change from 20 to six, uh, or to three, is a six-fold uh, uh, MSID, uh, uh, the minimal important clinical difference. And if you look at the delay of six months, they still are horribly painful. They're still badly dysfunctional. They still have a two to three fold MSID change, but you just spent three times as much money, caused six months of agony to get the same outcome. So when I testified before the Medicare administrative contractors and showed them these slides, they immediately changed their authorization process and ceased any delay in the patient's care because it was coming out of their budget. I was still getting good outcomes. Patients were still coming to me, but it was coming out of their budget. Next slide, please. So here are the payer benefits. So it's very important to represent that. One more forward. So when you look at the rewards of this kind of work, you have rewards to the, to the patient they get immediate pain relief. You have re rewards to the physician. The procedure was done efficiently and the patient enormously benefited. And you were able to uh, do that in a very efficient manner without a bunch of authorization. When you look at how it rewards you financially, your reimbursement tripled. So if you compare the uh, Medicare reimbursements associated with this during the restriction phase, the reimbursements for a procedure that takes me roughly 17 minutes is comparable to a, a joint replacement or a disc replacement. Next slide, please. So the, the physician benefits, but I didn't wanna focus on that so much. Here you see hospital health system benefits based on cohorts. 
And for those of you who are involved in uh, navigating bundles, these are what are called bundle busters. Uh, if you are not doing this kind of analytics for your outcomes, uh, you're going to end up at risk for significant costs. And these really are adverse events coming through the ER. These are readmits, these are take back to the, to the operating room. And you see that enrolling in a registry drops all of those lines and they get down into uh, areas where you can budget these bundle buses. They, they will occur, but at least you can budget and you can get secondary insurance for them. Next slide, please. So if you were to do this globally, you're talking about taking care, in this case, I'm looking at uh, osteoporosis, you're talking about taking care of half of the world's population. 20% of elderly women will come down with osteoporosis and, and its associated hip, knee, spine, wrist fractures, the fragility fracture uh, condition. And if these people are not treated, and what we've seen in the analytics of the vertebral compression fracture group and the data you see on death, debility and destitution comes from the hip fracture group, uh, there, there are consequent deaths to the delay in care. Next slide, please. So the vertebral compression fracture uh, uh, data that I showed you, the healthcare utilization data, uh, we're in the process of exporting globally uh, so that we can reach more women with this uh, more quickly. Next slide, please. The thing about registry is it gives you data that you can use in your practice. It helps you improve the quality of the care that you deliver. It's quality improvement. It's not research. And it's a collaboration that requires you think of other people's interests equal to your interests and put other people first. And when you put other people first, uh, you end up with an enormous trust that the things that you say and the data that you show are trusted and that helps make change. And that's it for me. Thanks. Outstanding. Thank you so much and congratulations on your accomplishments also. Um, uh, just two quick questions before we move on to our uh, honorary featured speaker from the East Coast, Dr. Cates. How much does it cost per capita to kind of get registry data per visit per patient? And does an EMR, an integrated EMR with automated PRO gathering help or is it kind of just still up to you to make sure that the data is entered? Okay, so for the Medicare piece, uh, Medicare came to us or the Medicare administrative contractor out west, west of the Mississippi, it's called Noridian. Uh, Palmetto and others are uh, east and south. Um, and the physicians paid for it and it was manual abstraction, don't ever do that. But it was 125 bucks per patient to accomplish this. And with the digitization, which we are now doing, so machine learning for unstructured and, uh, and for structured data, the cost will be less than a third of that. And the ballpark figure is it'll be somewhere around 25 bucks per patient. Super, all right. Thank you, and uh, I hope that you'll be available as a resource for others. Um, uh, we have uh, several colleagues uh, from several facilities on the line here tonight um, in terms of how to replicate your success model for other specialties in orthopedics. Yeah, and the, the, the good news for all you younger folks, uh, these tools that we are developing, the, the, the digital tools, the machine tools, the AI tools, uh, they are so much more accurate. Uh, human abstraction is just frighteningly inadequate. Uh, and the, the completeness percentage is in the 98, 99%. Uh, and it, it, it's so encouraging. Your practices are going to be marvelous. And you're going to love the data that you see. It'll be yours and it'll be compared to anonymous aggregate, which is wonderful. So thank you, Neil. And going from way out west, Dr. Sean came to us from uh, Kona in Hawaii. We'll go all the way out east and it's way late, it's 10 p.m. at night. Uh, Dr. Stephen Cates, professor, uh, 
Uh, Stephen Cates is the John Cardia Professor and Chair at the Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. He is a true visionary who's passionate. Before I go into his academic accomplishments very briefly, he is a compli- an accomplished furniture maker and classic car restorer. And yes, he is not opposed to muscle cars. Um, so this is just, again, great to um, have this kind of an expanded biography and shows his passion for perfection. He has changed the game for us, for instance, when I was at UW, uh, by introducing the worlds to geriatric fracture care as not something to hate, but actually something to do really well with metrics and with a multi-specialty approach. And tonight he's gonna talk to us about his insight, which again changed my practice and what we do now in spine, in terms of what to do with orthopedic implant infection. This affects all of us as orthopedic surgeons who have implants. So uh, I don't want to go on with your bio because it is so long, but I want to point out one highlight. He's also the Richard Brand Award winner for Outstanding Orthopedic Research in 2015, which is one of the rarest and most difficult to achieve accomplishments amongst many. Thank you, Stephen, for being here so late at night and educating us about what's up with orthopedic implant infections. Well, you're too kind, Jens. Uh... Thank you for inviting me to speak tonight. And uh, I'll talk to you about one of the areas I'm uh, uh, really interested in that puts a smile on my face when I'm, uh, uh, when I'm thinking about it, which is how to, how to defeat infections. So uh, I'll start off by um, going over a few learning objectives for tonight. Uh, I wanna talk to you about uh, some different modes that Staph aureus uses to establish osteomyelitis. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the host immune response and, and about biofilm. So um, one of the things we need to keep in mind, and I think that uh, uh, Neil and Michael both uh, in their way brought this uh, same topic up, is that orthopedics really is uh, in the midst of this crosshairs of health reform and, and is a... Uh, really a government target in so many ways. And uh, osteoarthritis is uh, up at the top. We see fracture of the neck of the femur, uh, complication of device, which is number nine uh, on this list of most expensive conditions. And then of course we have spine surgery and fractures making the list. Methicillin resistant Staph aureus or MRSA is uh, really a probably the most deadly pathogen we deal with routinely. Uh, there's 1.3 million new infections a year and an estimated 200,000 deaths. And really it's made all sorts of uh, covers of magazines. And uh, most recently, of course, we've spent a lot of time talking about COVID, but uh, uh, this is a problem that's not gonna go away very easily. So why is it really incurable when you get these kinds of infections? You know, we've all seen this sort of infection. Uh, you've got, and this is a X-ray of one of our patients in Virginia who comes in with this horrible construct. And uh, we open this up and take a look and all you see is a bunch of dead bone and surclage wires and the thing's just a mess. Uh, and th this is not an old X-ray, this was, this was from about two years ago. So this is, uh, this is current uh, sort of thing we're seeing roll in and it's Staph aureus. So the rates of recurrent infection after revision are really high, about 33%. The people who say that you, know, that you can get these down to one or 2%, I, I don't think are dealing with a, a tough revision practice. This is the sort of stuff we see routinely. Uh, maybe 62% of them are cured at one year post-op, and uh, they frequently reactivate even up to years later. And we've all heard of these cases, you know, that had a staph infection as a child, and then we see them as an older adult, and they have a recurrence, and it's penicillin-sensitive staph, so we know it's the old bug. And I'll show you why that is. We, you know, orthopedists have done this for 200 years that it gets in the bone, but uh, I'll show you how it actually does that. So, you know, this is a typical case. You know, this, this is a patient who's got a total hip replacement and it gets infected. And uh, this is a patient who one of my colleagues treated when I was still in Rochester. And a uh, patient ends up with uh, 
uh, dialysis uh, for a while after too much uh, aminoglycoside causes renal failure and finally ends up with the thing explanted, can't walk, is miserable, uh, quite expensive case as well. So we, we have to create a model that replicates the human condition uh, in uh, bone. And this is an in vivo model. This is not a Petri dish model. This is in a mouse. So the implant is a little uh, uh, wire there that's about the size of a 29 gauge needle. And it's pushed through the bone of a uh, mouse uh, tibia here. And you see how uh, the progression causes a reproducible osteomyelitis and the mouse doesn't get sick or die. And I I think there's like 8,000 of these we've done in the lab now. So it's a very reproducible operation. And that's a model that we've adopted as uh, uh, studying infection. One of the nice things is you can use a bioluminescent staff. So these staff uh, have the genome uh, modified by putting uh, the Lux operon in the genome, which is uh, the thing that makes the tail of a firefly glow. And so as the bacteria multiply, they're around four days to 11 days as the infection's really starting to get established and the bacteria are in a planktonic growth phase. You can measure the amount of light coming out of the leg with the IVIS dark box. The IVIS machine tells you how much growth there is. And so really what you see there is around 11 days is when these infections are becoming uh, clinically obvious and you know we all know that as uh, surgeons that this is uh, what happens so uh, where are these bacteria hiding well they really hide in three different areas they can hide in the soft tissue biofilm on the implants necrotic tissue and then uh, inside the bone cells so one of the uh, one of the things that uh, we saw when we did this model that I showed you with the pin through the tibia or what's called staphylococcal abscess communities. Uh, we didn't describe these. These were previously described in the kidney, uh, but we saw that these uh, sacs or staphylococcal uh, abscess communities form in the medullary canal of the bone. And this is what they look like. So you see this uh, eosinophilic rim and, you know, the bacteria is in the middle and it's surrounded by, uh, by a bunch of macrophages. And so uh, what ends up happening is the staph secretes virulence factors. It kills all your neutrophils. Um, those those uh, secreted virulence factors are called leukocytins. They kill white blood cells. And uh, uh, then it seems to be surrounded by this group of macrophages that can't penetrate it. And of course, uh, you know, this was described long before any of us were alive. Uh, by Sir Benjamin Collins Brody. It's the Brody's abscess, of course. But uh, this is uh, what we saw in the uh, mouse tibia. So the macrophages are excluded from the staphylococcal abscess communities uh, because when, when the staph kills the neutrophils, uh, the DNA of the neutrophil are chopped up by an enzyme called nuclease or nuke and um, uh, adenosine synthase and adenosine is released and uh, it it repels the macrophages from uh, this uh, center of uh, uh, bacteria so all of you've heard of apoptosis uh, but Probably not too many of you know about netosis, uh, and you know you certainly know about necrosis. Uh, netosis is uh, uh, when a uh, neutrophil spits its DNA out; it commits suicide and spits its DNA out on the bacteria and makes these nets. Uh, and the nets, uh, if you're caught in a net, you want a pair of scissors to escape from the net. The staff uses nuclease. Uh, the nuke uh, protein to escape. That's the scissors that cuts the gnat. And uh, it's one of our defense mechanisms uh, against uh, Staph aureus. And uh, uh, the uh, nuclease allows the staph to escape the gnat and adenosine synthase generates adenosine, which binds to the macrophage and repels it. Uh, 
So that's, that's one of the bacterial defense mechanisms. Uh, the staph uh, abscess communities uh, form in the bone marrow about two weeks after the, um, the infection is uh, in place. And so just think of this in terms of your own infections. A lot of people say, well, it's an early infection three or four weeks later. You can just wash it out. Don't change the implants. Just think that this is going on inside the bone. And um, I want everyone to understand that this is happening. I, uh, when my lab partner, Eddie Schwartz, showed me this, uh, he said, we just discovered something magnificent. The sacs are in the bone marrow. And I told him, it's a Brody's abscess, stupid. But uh, he, <laughs> uh, so he, this is uh, one of his slides. He, he was very excited about it. And uh, I, I, I keep that in there and so does he. It's kind of a funny moment. Um, so it forms these vicious uh, cycles. The, um, the staph abscess communities uh, will spit off a uh, daughter uh, of the abscess community and it replicates and spreads in the bone marrow. And, and it continues spreading and you get this fairly widespread osteomyelitis in the bone marrow. Um, and we, we were able to show again that the light coming off of the tibia really is a marker of planktonic growth of the bacteria. So around 11 days, you see it kind of disappears. It goes in 14 days, 18 days, there's no more light coming out. And that's because the bacteria are forming a biofilm. And so the biofilm forms on not only the implant, that, that needle or a little thin wire we have in the bone, but also on the necrotic tissue. So this should scare all surgeons. And I hope we'll maybe change the way you think about your early infections. So one day, and I'll show a close up of one day just so everyone gets a full view of it. Three days, seven days, 14 days, and 28 days after we establish an infection uh, on a piece of stainless steel in vivo. This is not in a petri dish, this is in a mouse's leg. And we know mice have good immune systems, they have a better immune system than we do. And this is what it looks like with the biofilm. And you notice there at 28 days, you see what looks like a honeycomb or an empty bee's nest. And the first time I saw this, I thought it had to be an artifact. These are electron micrographs. And I, I said, this has to be an artifact. This is not, this isn't real. I don't understand this. And so basically what we did is looked at it as uh, one day onward, all the way out to 64 days. And the bacteria emigrate out of the biofilm and, and then they spread, you know, they spread to other areas. So that's what's happening. And the honeycomb uh, appearance is where the bacteria have left the biofilm. If you look at it at three days, you see all the bacteria nesting there. Uh, you can see some of them at seven days, but 14 and 28 days, they're leaving the biofilm and spreading up and down the implant, up and down the tibia. So that's what's happening here. Uh, that's um, modulated by the accessory gene regulator of staph. So we know which gene allows that to happen. That's the emigration gene. And this is a close up of what your implant looks like at one day. So we've got some red blood cells, some fibrin, some bacteria, got all kinds of stuff on the implant at one day. So the early infection, in fact, isn't so early. Seven days later, 14 days later, you have a pretty, pretty established biofilm then. And uh, all of us should recognize that this is the case. So if you're going to leave your implant in and just hose it off, just remember this stuff is still there. It's not going away. And what does it look like in reality? Well, we've all seen something that looks like this. This is a plate of uh, the tibia. You can see the dead bone and it has a dull appearance. It's not really shiny. It's dull. And the dullness is the biofilm all over the implant. It's also all over the bone and all inside the bone. So we've all seen something that looks like this, if not something exactly like this. Um, so what's the real reservoir? You know, we can take out the implant. It doesn't seem to go away. 
if you look here, I, that's the total hip I showed you previously. On the back side of a total knee, uh, this is the back side of a total knee in the second panel. The black stuff is osmium tetroxide. And if you look at it on the, on the fourth panel, the second one below where the little yellow arrows are, you see the bacteria mixed in with the biofilm. This on the back side of a total knee, not, not the business side. This is the part that touches the bone. And this is why, you know, these debridement operations don't work with staff. It might work with a more indolent bacterium, but it does not work with staph. And then if you look inside the bone, again, there's your staphylococcal abscess communities. Uh, and those uh, persist unless you uh, get in there as a surgeon and remove them. Now, here's something we found that's really cool. And again, this is really scary. So what this represents is cortex of the bone. I've been showing you the medullary canal and those little uh, passages are the osteocyte canaliculi. So deep in your memory from residency, uh, you'll remember there's an osteocyte and it has all these little canalicular extensions that go around inside the cortical bone. And what we found out quite by accident, but with our funded research, was that the bacteria, these are Staph aureus, can crawl up the osteocyte canaliculus and occupy the osteocyte lacuna. And you see in some of the pictures, particularly the red arrowed ones, um, they're not round. So Staph, remember, is a shape of a ball. It's a coccus, and it doesn't have a tail or feet or any way to swim. So how did it force itself into a bacillus shape, a rod shape, and crawl up the inside of an osteocyte canaliculus. The Staph aureus is typically 0.5 to 1 micron in diameter, and typically the canalicular system is 0.2 to 0.3. So somehow it's squeezing in there and growing up the canalicular system. The yellow arrow, if you look at it, is a living osteocyte. That's what they're supposed to look like. And here it is right next to an infected one. So this is under the surface of the bone in the cortex, and you can't wash this off with a squirt gun or scrape it off with a Cobb elevator. This is, this is like inside the cortex. And so it's just sitting there waiting for you to drive a drill bit through it or a medullary reamer or a rasp by it to release those bacteria and get them growing again. And this is how the bacteria persist in the bone for 70 years in some cases. So if you look at it closely, here's a close up of what I showed you. You see they're bacillus shaped and no one ever found this before. We found this by accident and of course we've published it. Uh, but you know, here there are these odd shapes and uh, they managed to go up inside the canaliculus. So of course, when you find something really unusual, that is uh, your next uh, research grant application. And so we've gotten funded several times with this finding already, and uh, I'll show you what we've learned. So uh, one of the questions we came up with immediately is we've been told by particularly our infectious disease colleagues, my daughter's out in Seattle training now, she's finishing her ID fellowship. So I'm sure she knows more about this than I do. But um, if you take an oral antibiotic or even an IV antibiotic, it doesn't get in the bone. And we're told that the stuff really just doesn't have good penetrance in the bone. So what we did is we infected mice and then we put BRDU labels in their drinking water and let them drink it. And then we uh, looked at the bone seven, seven or 14 days later. I think these are seven day pictures. And we found that the BRDU got incorporated into the DNA of the staph. So the good news is when you put it in the drinking water, it actually does get in the bone, despite what the uh, medicine docs have told us about the, the uh, drugs, they actually do get there. The problem is they don't work. Uh, there's no cellular immunity and these bacteria are basically not dividing hardly at all. They're really almost in a hibernating state, very, very slow cell division. And so uh, the, the antibiotic that you've given by mouth or even IV even though it gets to the bacteria, it's not killing them because they need to be killed in rapid cell division. 
So uh, the antibiotic treatments probably also don't achieve really high concentrations in the bone and they form these uh, so-called small colony variants, uh, which are uh, very hard to kill with antibiotics. They have thick cell walls as we show here. These are actual pictures inside of a mouse's bone. So again, relevant model um, and uh, this is uh, non, not previously reported findings. So, okay, that's a mouse. How about a human? Does it happen in a human being? So the answer is yes. This is, you know, you've all seen a gnarly foot like this with diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, we, everyone has taken call has these come in. I think I cut one of these off every time I'm on trauma call. Um, and, you know, you've got a, a toe that comes off. And so the toe can end up in the lab and then we can take a look at the toe. And sure enough, there's the Staph aureus growing up inside the human uh, cortex and it looks just like the mouse. So yes, it does happen with a human being. It isn't just in the mouse. So, uh, you know, this is an interesting finding. You can look at this uh, and see how the osteocyte lacuna is completely occupied by the staph. So they're in there with their biofilm and they're hiding, they're hiding inside the, uh, uh, the osteocyte lacuna. You've all seen uh, osteolysis. And in fact, in later osteomyelitis, osteolysis is one of the hallmarks, right? So what happens is that these acidify the inside of the lacuna, they dissolve away some of the mineral, they eat the, uh, the proteins and whatever other nutrients are in the bone and continue to grow slowly. And what you see eventually is the bone gets rarefied or, or gets uh, osteolysis. And then on a plain x-ray, eventually you can identify it as infected. So this is, this is what's actually happening. And Again, this is underneath the surface of the bone. You can't hose it off with the squirt gun or scrape it off with a curette or something. This is, this is buried, and this should scare all of us. So how does it invade into there since it doesn't have a tail or feet, can't swim up there because we know it's too small to swim in. So what happens is this. this the uh, bacteria gets to the mouth of the osteocyte canaliculus which is on the periosteal surface and it sticks. The, the surface of Staph aureus has what's called adhesins or M-scrams. They're adhesins on the cell wall that stick to the bone like glue. And then it asymmetrically divides up the canalicular system, uh, one cell after another. So the daughter cell will go further up and the next daughter cell will go further up. So it uses what's called a haptotaxis and durotaxis to go up the canal. And so we, we made a model that looks like this with a, a microporous silicone sheet in there. And then the um, uh, bacteria can be deposited on one side and nutrients on the other. And it looks like this with the wild type Staph aureus on it. And that's uh, 0.3 microns, about the same size as a canaliculus. And it grows right through to the other side, amazingly. So it grows through the pores right, right on through. And we have pictures of it growing through. It's amazing. And the question is, how does it do that? What, what allows it to do that? And basically what we found is, uh, and here's a picture of that happening. So uh, penicillin binding protein four, is the protein that enables it to do what I just showed you. So if you knock that out, the delta penicillin binding protein four in the, in the uh, panel B shows no bacteria go through. Um, but for the wild type ones, they go right through the silicone. So um, basically, uh, uh, this is uh, what we're doing with these. You can look at it. Uh, we've infected the pin with uh, bacteria, dry it, put it in the tibia of the, uh, the mouse. There's the mouse. And then you take a look at it at 14 days and you can quantify what you get here. Um, 
what we have then is uh, histology. We look at the histology, we see where it's happening because otherwise it's like looking in the United States to find these things. It's a needle in the haystack. So we're, we look with plain histology, we pop that part off the slide and then do transmission electron microscopy uh, of it. And then you get this. So um, the penicillin binding protein, uh, basically if you prevent it from working, you knock it out, it will not grow up inside the bone. Uh, it only grows up when you have uh, that protein present. So you can uh, try and knock it out with uh, vancomycin, doesn't work. Uh, but if you knock out penicillin binding protein four, it's not gonna grow. So looking at it from a three-dimensional standpoint, there's a really cool technology. This is called a, a tomb tome. And basically, as the ultramicrotome sections off uh, little tiny uh, slices of the uh, resin embedded bone, uh, it goes onto a piece of tape. And then you can reconstruct it layer by layer by layer um, to make a three dimensional model. And um, what you get by stacking it up, like you see on the right, is, uh, is an idea of how it invades the cortex and the red, the red is infected and the green is not infected. And here they are next to each other. And it's hard to understand why some of them are not infected and some of them are. That's, that's obviously a question we need to answer is why does some not get infected? But this really is uh, the problem because once the bone's infected like this, we can't clear it out. Uh, just remember your cells your immune cells, the macrophage and neutrophils are way too big to get up those canaliculi. Um, and although the antibiotics get in there, they're, they're not working on these very slowly dividing uh, culprits. So uh, without cellular immunity, we're not able to get rid of them. And that's why these things persist. And that's why it's such a problem. So uh, I'm going to wrap it up. I know it's late and uh, probably don't want to put everyone to sleep. So a few things to think about when you're doing surgery, take multiple cultures. A lot of these folks have had some uh, empiric antibiotics used uh, for pretreatment. Uh, try to operate on them and do your biopsies with two weeks of uh, holiday from the drug. Uh, I'll put out there that with Staph aureus, you pretty much need to replace the implants. I know with spine surgery or pelvic implants, these are a pain to replace. And uh, my partners seem to like to give me the infected pelvic fractures. They want all the nice ones, but they'll, they'll hand over the infected ones. Even the residents don't want to do them. Um, I've done some of them by myself with a nurse. Uh, Perform a thorough bony debridement, including the medullary canal. That might mean using the back scratcher and the medullary reamer, a reamer irrigator aspirator, and clean the thing out good. Um, that really, I think, does make a difference. You get rid of some of those sacs. Um, excise all devitalized tissue. Obviously, you don't want to cut out a nerve or, uh, or a blood vessel if, if possible, but take all the rest of the dead tissue out. It's not going to do them any good. And uh, right now we are working on diagnostics to try to find the persistence of the infection. We have, we have a couple of things in the lab that show promise and uh, hopefully we'll make it to the clinic in the not too distant future. Uh, so to summarize, uh, the infected osteocyte canalicular network of live bone is really your major reservoir of infection. This is a colorized picture to horrify you. Um, the staph aureus are immune privileged. The cellular immunity can't get in there. They can't, you know, you really can't use your immune system effectively to get rid of this. And that's mediated by the cell wall enzymes, the adhesins, um, and also the penicillin binding protein number four. Uh, and these surface adhesins and, and penicillin binding protein four will be future targets for us to, to, to get rid of them. Um, so we've got a lot of, of cool stuff going on. I, I will tell you that we have done some work with strep 
strep will also invade in the osteocyte canalicular network, just not as quickly and not as effectively. But we do have some pictures of it as well, particularly the group G uh, straps. So um, obviously I didn't do all this work myself. Uh, this, is, um, this is the whole group of people that I work with. A bunch of them are from my old place in Rochester. Uh, we do uh, a lot of the stuff in Richmond, but uh, we do have uh, colleagues who have contributed. And uh, uh, this um, in the middle down here, this blonde haired lady, she's uh, up here at the top as well. That's Karen Bentley. Those are all her uh, electron micrographs. She's magnificent at doing this. Um, this work's been funded by AO Trauma Clinical Priority Program on Bone Infection. We've been privileged to have uh, nine straight years of uh, program grant funding for that. And the uh, P30 grant and our P50 grant, we have the P50 grant on bone infection from uh, NIAMS, which we've just reapplied for uh, you know, competitive renewal on. So, um, you know, this is what funded research can do if you really persist on one topic. And, uh, you know, I'm very pleased with what we've discovered. This is, these are a couple of the good discoveries. We got a couple more that are really uh, impressive discoveries as well that uh, are being published or are published now. So thanks for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. So thank you uh, on behalf of all of us, and there'll be many views on the recordings also, uh, Dr. Cates, and uh, especially in light of the fact that it's way late for you at night on the East Coast. So uh, I have three questions, then I have one from Dr. Udawada. Uh, that's a great question. I'm going to go with him first because it's better than my questions. Uh, in the setting of an unstable fusion or fracture, and you have an infection, that age-old equation of stability versus uh, inflammation through persistent stability and stability inferred by hardware. Uh, when do you pull the trigger to take the hardware? And if you have identified staff, do you have to take the hardware out earlier? So give us some guidance as to stability, uh, healing, and ongoing infection propagation. Yeah, so that's a great question. I, I think uh, with any type of infection, even soft tissue infections, stability or holding the area still makes a difference. So, uh, you know, if you have a hand infection or a foot infection or any infection, holding it still seems to help. So um, if the implants are unstable, uh, you should remove them and create some sort of stability. That can be with a frame. It can be with a, a nail. Uh, it can be with a plate. Uh, I would try to minimize the amount of implants you put in if possible, but you do want to achieve stability. The antibiotic bone cement probably doesn't help very much. It, it, the uh, effect of it is gone in two or three days. Um, but stability is important and instability helps infections persist. So uh, I, I think stability is an important uh, thing to achieve whatever way you achieve it. Great answer. And uh, that goes back to Dr. Ted Hansen's original old work uh, also in his clinical experience. <clears throat> Uh, my question to you, number one, is if in your mouse model you give those mice IV antibiotic prophylaxis, could you still create that same scary colonization infiltration of the canaliculi? Um, yes, it still will happen. Uh, it, it happens better if you don't do that. Um, the, the way we originally discovered it was with an infected 5-0 nylon suture next to the bone. So there wasn't even an implant in there. We had done like a sham surgery. And uh, again, it was an incidental finding. It was an accident. We uh, just sutured the mouse up. There was a 5-0 nylon stitch that was infected. And right next to that was the original finding when we did the uh, electron microscopy. So we saw it and we're like, again, is this real? And so we did more of them. And the project initially had a different goal, but we made this uh, tremendous finding. It was a little pilot grant. It was like a $15,000 pilot grant. And so we applied for program grant funding based on this. And, uh, uh, you know, the P50, uh, part of the P50 is on this and part of the uh, CPP bone infections on this now. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a cool finding. You cannot sterilize the implants and the bone with antibiotics locally, 
systemically and even antibodies against the staph with antibiotics locally and systemically do not sterilize the implants. Great. So then uh, in our field, at least in spine, there's an increased uh, or increasing tendency of industry to offer bioactive, hollow, whatever, uh, permeative membrane surfaces, very complex, uh, allegedly nano uh, structured surfaces for uh, biologic ingrowth. Aren't they just a feast uh, all the more for uh, this kind of an infiltrative process? Do we create a bigger problem perhaps in the future? I, I would say I would say yes. <laughs> I mean, they are they are uh, amazingly complex, at least what they show you. So so I'm very worried about this trend of uh, these complex biomimicking uh, surface uh, 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 implant development. My third quick question, then I want to uh, leave the field for my colleagues. Uh, I know Dr. Brown had a question also. Um, where are we with staph immunizations? I know you had mentioned that a couple of years ago, and I kind of lost uh, uh, the thread on that. So is this uh, something that can be uh, maybe dealt with with immunizations beforehand? So great question. We're, we're actually working on that. We've developed a bunch of targets, and we've met with Moderna about it. Um, we'll see where that goes, but, uh, we are, uh, we're actively working on that. Uh, we've, we, st we did the old fashioned ones with passive immunizations. Uh, uh, we've tried, uh, active immunization. Uh, the passive immunization helps somewhat, but is not curative for implant associated infection. Um, the, and again, that's when someone has an established infection, the, uh, Passive immunization, in other words, the, the mouse is sick. We haven't given it to a person, obviously, but mouse is sick. You give them the passive immunity, the immunity. It does help, but it's not curative. So you still have to locally treat the infection. Even with local antibiotics, vancomycin, and passive immunity, you still don't get rid of the infection. So um, we've published this. I think there's about four or five papers we've put out. Uh, and basic science. Obviously, we haven't done it on a, on a human. We've done it on sheep uh, and on uh, mice. So the fan club is here. We've finished the formal program. Dr. Brown, Greg Brown, good to see you again, sir. You're looking good. Uh, good. You've never had a, a total hip infection, I know, or a total knee infection. So on a hypothetical basis, what questions do you want to ask for the professor? Hey, Greg. Uh, actually, hi, Stephen. Hi, Mike. Um, actually, my question is... Um, uh, it, it comes from an old Harborview uh, surgeon that some of you know, Mark Swinkowski. So he became my chair when I was a chief resident and I, my partner for a number of years. And what he taught me, and it seemed to work well for me, and I'm curious how it fits into what you said, Stephen, was, um, you know, often I, I can I'll get a superficial wound infection or something, have a hard time healing. I know I can't sterilize it. I don't want to keep taking this person back to oper you know, operating room, taking things out, putting them back in. Um, and so I will just suppress it with antibiotics, get it to heal. You know, it's often around an ankle. When I know they're walking pain-free, you know, there's enough healing that I go in and take out of the implants. And then I, I seem to get my wounds healing. And I probably have a, you know, latent infection in there, but the, they don't drain. They don't, you know, patients do well. Um, you ever use that kind of a strategy? Oh, absolutely. Again, you, you get stability that that only works if the implants are stable, of course. Yeah. And, you know, you let it heal uh, and then take the implants out later. And, and many, many times the patient will still have a satisfactory outcome. If you ask them, though, I would put out there, Greg, that a lot of them still have some pain. Uh, you take the implants out, they still have a little bit of pain, but they're okay. You probably have some uh, staff that have been basically fought to a stalemate by the uh, immune system, and they're, they're in the bone, they're quiescent. It's, um, you know, if you made another drill hole through there and put another implant, you might get an infection, but... Uh, uh, yes, what you describe is, you know, you've given stability, you've given good treatment, and they heal. And uh, that's healing a fracture. It doesn't work so well to do that with a joint replacement, but it works reasonably well with a fracture. So, so in, in answer to your question and her comment, Jens, is that 
my scariest knee replacement is one that's had a tibial plateau fracture with the plate and screws that I go take out. You know, it, I, I know I can't sterilize it. So antibiotics and cement, and, you know, and I, I even, even two stage it where I go in and take out the implants first before I do the total knee. So I'm not doing it the same setting, but it's still the scariest operation for a knee replacement. Totally agree with you. So Dr. Greenwald, Alan, good to see you tonight. And as I yeah. said, freshly baked uh, new father-in-law, his uh, daughter just got married last week on Mazel Tov. Thanks. Alan, your, Thanks. your question to the professor. Great to see you again, Stephen. Thanks. Good it was incredible. <laughs> Very good. Really scary stuff. This is worse than any alien movie I've ever watched. Um, uh, I, I have a lot of questions, but I, I'll skip most of them and ask you about uh, two things. One, what do you think about uh, the uh, possibility of bacteriophage therapy in the future uh, and you, your, your group wrote an article about anti-glucosaminidase antibodies, and I was wondering if you're going to mention that and whether we should be measuring things like that in our patients. Um, so I'll, I'll stop at those two questions. So um, question number one, uh, I think you hit on one of the potential uh, solutions is uh, giving a phage therapy because that will kill the bacteria directly, you could put it in their drinking water or uh, you know, intravenous and it will penetrate to the bone and we'll get the staph. Uh, so if you had the right phage, I think that that is a solution. Uh, there are some folks uh, in Eastern Europe and even a few in Germany who've tried that and it does work. So uh, uh, brilliant, totally agree with you. Uh, regular antibiotics, no. Um, and then um, the anti-GMD or anti-glucaminidase antibodies. So we've published this a few times. Uh, most recent time was in JBJS in October. Uh, it is a, a positive antibody. In other words, it's a good one to have uh, against staph. Glucaminidase is uh, part of the enzyme complex that allows the staph to divide into two daughter cells every 20 minutes in planktonic growth phase. The other one is aminidase. So uh, glucaminidase, the uh, antibodies to that are thought to be protective uh, against uh, bad results and protective against infection. The problem is we all have anti-GMD antibodies and still you can get a staph infection. So there's probably more to it. Uh, the immune system's pretty complex and uh, we are working on that. And of course, there's the bacteria. The bacteria are all different. So uh, that needs to be defined better. But the answer to your question is that would be one of the things that I would like to eventually measure as a predictive, uh, either of, uh, as, as a predictive test for outcome or maybe predictive of who's at risk for an infection. So the answer to your question is yes, we probably should measure it at some point. Um, I've, I'm working on a study now to come up with an algorithm as to are there other factors plus the GMD value or other antibodies that we could put together to have a predictive test. It looks like the answer is not yet. Um, so more to follow on that. We, we hope to have a paper on, on that shortly. Real quickly, one more. What's, what's up with the... Uh your staff vaccine program. I, I haven't heard much about that in a while. Yes. So we're um, obviously we were knocked backwards uh, with the pandemic, like every other research project. Uh, we are talking with Moderna about it now. Um, we'll see. We'll see if that comes to fruition. But we're developing some potential targets to come up with an mRNA vaccine uh, for it. So we'll see if that if that uh, you know, they, they haven't signed anything with us, nor we with them. So we're just, we're, we're in the process of considering that at this point. Great. Stephen, this is Neil Shonard. I wanted to ask you a question of you, if I could. Um, uh, give me, if you could give us uh, your reflections on the present orthopedic practice of uh, sprinkling vancomycin in a wound that has hardware. When Jens and I were participating in the uh, spine scope registry, uh, I ran a signal metric, uh, just yes, no, who was putting in antibiotics. And we're schizophrenic out in the Pacific Northwest. 4,800 of us uh, put it in, 4,874 of us didn't put it in. Uh, 
Uh, that was underpowered, so we ran the power up to 16,800. When we looked at it, the confounders didn't let us answer it. Uh, so there is, uh, at least in, in my understanding, there's an angst that drives a behavior that is absent the science that should underpin the behavior and the angst wins out. Uh, well said. I, <laughs> I think the idea of uh, uh, people uh, I know refer to it as uh, pixie dusting the wound with vancomycin or, or another Parmesan on a pizza. Biotic. Is that what you call Parmesan pixie on a pizza? Mexican wedding cookies, you know. Okay. Well, anyway, the, the, the powdered antibiotics in the wound, they're gone in a short time. Uh, so it probably doesn't help uh, much in the long term. So uh, there are certainly uh, some open fracture studies that are being done by the metric consortium that suggest at least uh, for the one study, uh, I believe that was the metric Banco study that that it had some effect. Uh, I believe I just read a, um, I believe it was a meta-analysis of spine studies on this, probably also not powered adequately that it didn't help. So um, I don't think it's a question that's answered at this point effectively. It's, it, you, you explained it perfectly, anxiety about getting an infection. You know, maybe you're operating on somebody that you shouldn't operate on, or it's really an undesirable candidate for surgery you throw the pixie dust in the wound and try and prevent an infection. I, I, don't, I don't think it helps. Thank you. Dr. Cates, question for you. 